a blessed, a blessed day, to day to all of you. All of I am Maribel Du. I am Jane Isabel Driza. Today, Today we will be discussing the historical, the historical foundation of education. At the end of this chapter, you should be able to state the relationship of society and schools, prove that schools transmit cultural values by stating facts from education history in the world and in the Philippines, explain the meaning of socialization as a function of According to Britannica.com, John Dewey is an American philosopher and an educator who was a co-founder of the philosophy called movement known as the pragmatism, a pioneer in functional psychology, an innovative theorist of democracy, and the leader of progressive movement and education in the United States. So, when a school introduces and trains its child of society into membership within such a little community, saturating him with the spirit of service and providing him with the instruments of effective self-direction, we shall have the deepest and best guarantee of a larger society which is worthy, lovely, and harmonious. So, what is the function of schools according to John Dewey's statement? Answering the first question, according to John Dewey, school introduces and trains each child of society into membership within such a little community. So we as learners, we are expected to instill self-discipline and take a bigger role as a hope of our future generations living in our community. School doesn't only shape our minds about academics, but it also gives us a direction into behaving as a good member of our community. So, who creates schools? Schools are created by the society. The society needs to maintain peace and order, develop and prosper, and ensure stability. In order to do this, schools are created to train each individual as a good member of society. What is the relationship between school and society? School and society are allies for development. They are like two best friends helping each other grow to the best they can be. The school provides the needs of the society and develop individuals to behave well in the community. The school and the society helps reach its full potential into creating a harmonious community. Abstraction, let's conceptualize. Education or school is an institution created by the society. Education is a function of society and as such arises from the nature and character of the society itself. Society seeks to preserve itself and to do this, it maintains its functions and institutions, one of which is education, to assure its survival, stability, and convenience. As what John Dewey claimed, it is the school that introduces and trains its child of society into membership within such a little community, saturating him with the spirit of service and providing him with the instrument of effective self-direction. So what happens when the school succeeds to do this? We guarantee a worthy, harmonious, and lovely society. So, this is called the socialization process. Socialization is the process of learning the rules, statuses, and values necessary for participation in social institutions, according to Binkern of 1989. Socialization is a lifelong process. It occurs primarily during the early childhood, but as we progress from infancy to old age, we shed our roles and adopt new ones. Role learning that prepares us for future roles is termed anticipatory socialization, according to Brinkerhoff, 1989. Because of anticipatory socialization, most of us are more or less prepared for our future roles like spouse, parent, and professional teacher. And the family is the most important agent of socialization. Psychology tells us that the self-concept formed during childhood has lasting consequences. Besides, the parents' religion, social caste, and ethnicity influence the child's social roles and self-concept. So, aside from the family, school is also an important agent of socialization. It is an institution charged by society to
to impart specific knowledge and skills necessary for functioning in the society. They are also charged with the task of transmitting society's cultural values. The next part of this chapter is devoted to how schools, may it be formal or informal, did their task as agents of socialization in different periods of history. Education in Primitive Society, as explained by Brinker Hope, 1899. So, in primitive societies, preliterate persons faced the problem of survival in an environment that pitted them against natural forces and wild animals. To survive, human beings needed food, shelter, warmth, and clothing. To transform a hostile environment into one that is life-sustaining, humankind developed life skills that eventually became cultural patterns. So what are these life skills? It includes tool or instrument making, adherence to moral behavior code of group life, and number three, language. So when there was no formal education, the parents and the tribe leaders are responsible to teach the younger generations. So people in primitive society found security in a group life based on kinship and tribal patterns. Life in the human group was educational as children observed and learned from the elders as they were deliberately taught by their parents and elders. For these cultural patterns to continue, the adults had to teach these skills and values to their children. This is socialization, a function of education and society. Socialization is a process by which individuals eternalize the norms and values of society and so social and cultural continuity are attained this is also informal education in action we must be thankful to our ancestors because their creation of oral and written language made it possible to what we are now so let's proceed to keep periods in educational history Study the table thoroughly and you can see the relevance of the time period and what the society considers important during that time period. So let's begin first with primitive societies from 7000 BC to 5000 BC. So what are the educational goals? They are doing education to teach group survival skills to cultivate group cohesiveness. So, the curriculum are practical skills of hunting, fishing, food gathering, stories, myths, songs, patterns, and dances. The agents are the parents, tribal elders, and priests. So, what are the influences on Western education? Emphasis on the role of informal education in transmission of skills and values. Then, let's proceed to Greeks. It started from 1600s BC that ended in 300 BC. The Greeks are separated into two, the Athenians and the Spartan. But both of their educational goals was to cultivate civic responsibility and identity with city-state. For the Athenians, they want to develop well-rounded person, while in Spartans, they want to develop soldiers and military leaders. That is why Athenians are more focused on reading, writing, arithmetic, drama, music, physical education, literature, poetry, while the Spartans are focused on drill, military songs, and tactics. For Athenians, private teachers and schools, sophists, philosophers, and for the Spartans, military teachers, drill surgeons are the agents of this education. Now let's proceed to Roman, 750 BC to AD 450. Romans aimed to develop sense of civic responsibility for republic and then empire. That is why their influence on Western education was the emphasis on ability to use education for practical administrative skills relating education to civic responsibility. Arabic started from AD 700 and was ended on AD 1350. The main goal was to cultivate religious commitment to Islamic beliefs. Thus, mosques, court, schools are the agents of the education. And their influence on Western education was Arabic numerals and computation, classical materials on science and medicine. 
while on medieval period that started on AD 500 and ended on AD 1400s, the main goal was to develop religious commitment, knowledge, and ritual. That is why parish, chantry, and cathedral schools, universities, apprenticeship, knighthood are the agents of education. Their influence on Western education, establishing the structure, content, and organization of the university as major institution of higher education. During the Renaissance period, their primary goal was to cultivate a humanist who was expert in classics, Greek and Latin. That is why Latin, Greek, classical literature, poetry, art are taught. The agents of their education was classical humanist educators in schools such as Lycee, Gymnasiums, Latin Grammar School. The Renaissance influence on Western education was an in emphasis on literary knowledge, excellence in styles as expressed in classical literature. During Reformation period that started from AD 1500s and ended on AD 1600, their primary goal was to cultivate a sense of commitment to a particular religious denomination. Reading, writing, arithmetic, Catholicism, religious concepts, Latin and Greek theology were taught. The agents of their education was vernacular elementary schools for the masses, classical schools for the apple classes. Their contribution to Western education was a commitment to universal education to provide literacy to the masses. Here's a little bit of summary about the seven key periods on the development of education. In primitive societies, survival against natural forces was the need. For the Athenian in Greece, what mattered most in education was rounded development. While for the earlier Romans, schools needed to develop a sense of civic responsibility. For the ancient Arabic, where Islam rose the most important concern, Islamic beliefs was the primary focus. During the medieval period, religious commitment was their first goal. While in Renaissance period or the rebirth, schools are more focused on rediscovery of classic philosophy, literature, and art. The Reformation period focused on cultivation of a sense of commitment. In conclusion, the goals of education vary from the needs of the society. Today, we are going to talk about the history of the Philippine educational system. Let us also see how the nature and the character of Philippine society are reflected in the education process in different periods of Philippine history. After watching this video discussion, you will be able to trace the history of the Philippine educational system. Class, as we talk about the Philippine educational system, just remember the sociological concept, which is the focus of this lesson. That education is a function of society and as such what are taught in schools arise from the nature and character of society itself. What society considers important is what schools teach. Let's start with education during the pre-colonial period. Education was informal and unstructured back then. It is also decentralized. Fathers taught their sons how to look for food and other means of livelihood. Mothers taught their daughters to do the household chores. This education basically prepared their children to become good husbands and wives. Children were provided more vocational training but lesser academics. Teachers are tribal tutors. We call it Babylon or Catalunan. Education during the Spanish era. Education was formal and organized this time. It was authoritarian in nature. Tribal tutors of the pre-Spanish period were replaced by Spanish missionaries. Pupils attended formal schooling in the parochial school. Instruction was religion-oriented. Christian doctrines, sacred songs, and music and prayers were taught because they are required for confession and communion. There was a separate school for boys and girls. 
wealthy Filipinos or the illustrados were accommodated in the schools. Let's move on to the educational decree of 1863. This law gave Filipinos a complete system of education from elementary to the collegiate level. The law provided for the establishment of the elementary schools in all municipalities in the country. Although religion was core of the curriculum, the curriculum included subjects like reading, writing, arithmetic, history, Christian doctrine, Spanish language, vocal music, agriculture for the boys, and little work for the girls. Attendance in school was compulsory between the ages of 7 and 12. Education during the American regime 1898 to 1946. The Americans promoted democratic ideals and a democratic way of life. The schools maintained by the Spaniards for more than three centuries were closed but were reopened on August 29, 1898 by the Secretary of the Interior. In May 1898, the first American school was established in Corregidor, and shortly after the capture of Manila in 1899, seven schools were reopened in the city. Training was done through the schools, both public and secular month by chaplains and military officers of the U.S. Army. Thomasites arrived in the Philippines on August 23, 1901. The University of the Philippines was founded in 1908. UP was the first state school of university status. The Department of Public Instruction set up a three-level school system. First level considered a four-year primary and three-year intermediate or seven-year elementary curriculum. The second level was a four-year junior college and later a four-year program. Let's move on to the Commonwealth period 1935 to 1942. Free education in public school was provided all over the country in accordance with the 1935 Constitution. Vocational education and some household activities like cooking and farming were also given importance. Education also emphasized nationalism so that students were thought about the life of the Filipino heroes. Vocational education and some household activities were also given importance. Good manners and discipline were also taught to the children. The Institute of Private Education was established in order to observe private schools and formal adult education was also given. Executive Order No. 134 of 1936 was signed by President Manuel Quezon designating Tagalog as our national language. Executive Order No. 217, otherwise known as the Quezon Code of Ethics, was taught in schools. Executive Order No. 263 in 1940 required the teaching of the Pelofino national language in the senior year of all high schools and all years in the normal schools. The Education Act of 1940 was approved by the Philippine Assembly on August 7, 1940, which provided for all the following. Number 1. Reduction of the 7-year elementary course to 6 year. Second. Fixing the school entrance age at 7. Third, national support for elementary education. Fourth, compulsory attendance of primary children enrolled in grade 1. Lastly, adoption of double single session in the primary grade with one teacher, one class assignment for intermediate teachers. The Japanese occupation. Aims of education during Japanese occupation are the following. First, Make the people understand the position of the Philippines as a member of the East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Second, eradication of the idea of reliance upon Western states, particularly the U.S. and the Great Britain. Third, fostering a new Filipino culture based on the consciousness of the Filipino as Orientals. Fourth, elevating the moral of the people, giving up over emphasis on materialism. Fifth, diffusion of elementary education and promotion of vocation education. Sixth, striving for the diffusion of the Japanese language in the Philippines 
and the termination of the use of English in schools. And lastly, developing in people the love of labor. So, based from 1973 Constitution, the fundamental aims of education was to foster love of country, teach the duties of citizenship, develop moral character, self-discipline, and scientific, technological, and vocational efficiency. There are other developments made in education system. And it is all developed because the need of the society. In order to attain a high quality education, these developments are vital. Varied goals of education in different historical periods of development history. What was considered important in each historical period of the country was also the focus or direction of the education of the Filipino. During the pre colonial period, Students were given vocational training but lesser academics for them to be good fathers and mothers. During the Spanish period, schools focused on the religious formation to help them live the Christian faith. The American regime educated the Filipinos to become good citizens of a democratic country, while the Japanese regime taught them to love of labor. The post-colonial period educational system was devoted to the following goals. First, foster love of country. Second, teach the duties of citizenship. Third, develop moral characters and self-discipline. Fourth, scientific, technological, and vocational efficiency. The present depth and vision and mission statement and core values and the fourth mission of the Commission on Higher Education add light to the present goals of Philippine education. They are given below. To produce top full graduates imbued with values reflective of a human humanist orientation, analytical and problem solving skills, the ability to think things through the ethical and social implication of a given source of action, and the competency to learn continuously throughout life that will enable them to live meaningfully in a complex, rapidly changing, and globalized world while engaging their community and the nation development issues and concerns. The Department of Education has the following vision and mission. The Deaf Ed Vision. We dream of Filipinos who passionately love their country and whose values and competences enable them to realize their full potential and contribute meaningfully to building the nation. A vision is your school goal where you hope to see it in the future. The Deaf Ed Mission to protect and promote the right of every Filipino to quality, equitable, culture-based, and complete basic education where students learn in a child-friendly, gender-sensitive, safe, and motivating environment. Teachers facilitate learning and constantly nurture every learner. Administrators and staff, as stewards of the institution, ensured an enabling and supportive environment for effective learning to happen. Family, community, and other stakeholders are actively engaged and share responsibility for developing lifelong learners. The mission provides an overview of the steps planned to achieve that future. Developing the school's vision and mission are two of the most important steps toward creating a successful program. Done well, they give clarify and direction for a school. A mission and vision can help lead to continuing conflicts and a school that has difficulty identifying priorities. We have four core values. Makajos, makatao, makakalikasan, at makabansa. So, why is it important to study the history of education? You may ask, why would we bother studying the past when we are living in the present? But no, 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 you should not underestimate the value of studying the history. Studying the history of education will first give you educational issues and problems are often rooted in the past. The study of educational history can help us to understand and solve today's problems. Understanding the past will make us control the present and 
if we control our present, then we can shape our future. The study of education spies provides a perspective that explains and illuminates our present activities as teachers. By understanding the past, we reflect more and we analyze. We understand the present events and we can solve current issues regarding the system of our education. Application Let's Apply why was the focus of education different from different groups of people in different places and at different periods in world history? Why does this point regarding relationship of schools and society? So, the focus of education varies from the need of the society. There are different educational goals and curriculum because the schools uh, teach what is relevant in the time period and place. School create educational goals to what the society consider important. The goals of education in pre-colonial is about life skills, Spanish is Christianity, in American democracy, Japanese value of hard work, and in post-colonial nationalism, good citizenship, and being a well-rounded individual. During the pre-colonial period, the people did not meet the equal access to education, as well as on Spanish period. But when Americans introduced democracy, we are now given a chance for a free education. Answering the fourth question, the current Philippine education system gives equal access to every Filipino student. It is not a privilege of a few because it is free and accessible to everyone. Dollar urged to address job skills mismatch. Chad, Dole, and Testa, they want to address their problem of job skills mismatch. Can we say that the education system is effective now that there is a high rate of job skills mismatch? Of course, yes, schools are effective agents of transmitting knowledge. However, factors like financial capability and opportunity, many things became a barrier into pursuing what they really want. Answering the question for number 6, 21st century schools should pursue higher and innovative technological advancement. We are in a blended learning mode. Technology made everything convenient for us, however, too much dependence on technology is also bad. The ideal 21st century graduate is morally upright, disciplined, and knows the 21st century skills. So will the survival skills taught in primitive societies suffice for the citizens of 21st century world? Of course not! Simply because this is not what the society needs in the present time. So here are the key takeaways. The takeaways are education and school are a function of and creation of our society. So the school and the education was created by the society due to its needs. Goals in education reflect what society considers as necessary for survival, stability, and convenience. Studying history of education is vital. Schools are agents of socialization. They prepare individuals for their varied roles in the society. So and that's the end of our topic. Hope you learned something. Thank you for listening.